Hey guys, and welcome to today's idiot video. Today's video covers everyone's favorite flat earth punching bag and godfather of the flat earth idiot movement, Eric Dubé, and his absolute misunderstanding of how the seasons work on our beautiful globe earth. Now if you've been paying attention to the flat earth for more than 24 hours, it's guaranteed that a flat earther has brought up Eric Dubé and his 200 flat earth pukes. I mean, proofs. He's essentially the Jim Jones of the flat earth, and this video is one flavor of his funny tasting Kool-Aid. So grab a beer and let's begin. In the flat earth model, the sun and moon luminaries revolve around the earth once every 24 hours for the sun and approximately 25 hours for the moon illuminating like spotlights the areas over which they pass. Oh great, starting off stupid. His claims that the sun and moon are spotlights illuminating the earth is one of the dumbest claims that flat earthers make. If the earth is flat and the sun is a spotlight, then how the fuck does the terminator line make a straight line across the surface of the earth on the equinox? Eric Dubé, you're an idiot. The sun's annual journey from tropic to tropic, solstice to solstice, is what determines the length and character of days, nights, and seasons. Nope. The seasons, length of days, and all that other shit is determined by the axial tilt of the Earth and its position along its orbit. The position of the Sun and the Moon on the flat Earth model represent nothing more than the subsolar and sublunar points on the surface of the spherical Earth. Flat Earthers would know this if they took the time to learn the cosmology of truth but instead they rather continue believing they live on pizza earth. But flat earthers are fucking idiots. This is why equatorial regions experience almost year-round summer and heat, while higher latitudes north and especially south experience more distinct seasons with harsh winters. Again, you're wrong. The average heat received in an area on the surface of the earth has more to do with its average angle of incidence of the sun rays striking the surface, I'll be covering it more in detail later in this video, but for now, let's just continue. The heliocentric model claims seasons change based on the ball Earth's alleged axial tilt and elliptical orbit around the Sun. Their flawed current model even places us closest to the Sun, 91,400,000 miles, in January, when it is actually winter, and farthest from the Sun, 94,500,000 miles in July, when it's actually summer throughout much of the Earth. This is one of those claims that I have yet to address, and it's actually a pretty decent claim, as many globe earthers don't really understand how it can be warmer in the northern hemisphere on their summer solstice than it is in the southern hemisphere on their summer solstice, even though the Earth is about 3 million miles closer to the Sun during the southern summer solstice. Using the inverse square law, you can calculate their difference in energy from the Sun during these opposing solstices and it comes out to about 6% less energy received from the sun during the northern summer solstice. So it would logically follow that the earth should be cooler during the summer solstice for the north, but the exact opposite is what we observe. Flat earth idiots will claim that this is because the sun makes a tighter circle around the north pole, resulting in less travel speed for their spotlight sun needed to complete its circuit. Since it's moving slower, it heats the land up underneath it more than when it's traveling faster on its circuit during the summer solstice for the south. Actually what's happening is that even though the earth is further away during the northern summer solstice, there is more land in the north, and land has a lower specific heat than water does. This means that it takes less energy from the sun to raise the temperature of the land than it does to raise the temperature of the water. So even though the Earth is further away from the Sun and receives less energy, due to the increased amount of land, the Northern Hemisphere will be warmer than the Southern Hemisphere on their respective summer solstices. They say due to the ball Earth's tilt, different places receive different amounts of direct sunlight, and that is what produces the seasonal and temperature changes. This makes little sense, however. To a flat Earth idiot, because if the sun's heat travels over 90 million miles to reach the ball earth, how could a slight tilt, a mere few thousand miles maximum, negate the sun's 90 million mile journey, giving us simultaneous tropical summers and Antarctic winters? 
The distances from the sun to the subsolar point and the sun to the poles are relatively the same. So the energy from the sun that reaches those two points are about the same. However, we see drastic differences in the energy received at the subsolar point than we do at the poles. Flat earthers will say that this is because the distance between the sun and the subsolar point is much shorter than the distance from the sun to the poles since the sun is small and local and not 93 million miles away. But flat earthers, like Eric Dubay, are a bunch of fucking idiots and they're totally fucking wrong. The real explanation behind these observable phenomena is that the Earth's surface curves and the angle of incidence increases as you get further away from the subsolar point. And as the angle of incidence increases, the same amount of energy gets spread out over a larger surface area on the sphere. Thomas Winship said, The Earth is a stretched out structure which diverges from the central north in all directions towards the south. The equator, being midway between the north center and the southern circumference, divides the course of the sun into north and south declination. The longest circle around the world, which the sun makes, is when it has reached its greatest southern declination. Gradually going northwards, the circle is contracted. In about three months after, the southern extremity of its path has been reached. There's something highly ironic about this statement that not many people have addressed. The description that Eric Dubé read is most certainly from the perspective of someone in the northern hemisphere. If someone were to simply use observations from the southern hemisphere, they would come to the exact opposite conclusion, that the Earth is an extended plane with concentric circles around the southern pole, with the sun and the moon making a circuit between the tropics around this pole. However, a critical thinker using natural observations from either hemisphere would come to the exact same conclusion, that the Earth is a sphere and the sun is extremely large and very far away. But flat earthers aren't known for their critical thinking skills because flat earthers are fucking idiots. This movement round the earth daily is the cause of the alternations of day and night. Bullshit. If the sun was simply above the earth and going around in a circle, then we would never experience a sunrise or sunset. Eric Dubé, you're an idiot. While his northerly and southerly courses produce the seasons. When the sun is south of the equator, it is summer in the south and winter in the north, and vice versa. The fact of the alternation of the seasons flatly contradicts the Newtonian delusion that the Earth revolves in an orbit around the sun. First off, it was Copernicus who put the Earth in orbit around the sun, who was born 170 years before Newton, you idiot! And before you can claim that the sun flies around the earth and that's what causes the seasons, you would need to explain how the sun flies, how it speeds up as it gets further south, and how it slows down as it gets further north, and how it changes direction on its own and heads back towards the equator. I guess it's on flat earthers to redefine physics. Take that, quantum physicists. It is said that summer is caused by the earth being nearest the sun, and winter by its being farthest from the sun. And you are an idiot! No one says that the Earth's seasons are caused by the distance to the sun, because it's summer in the hemisphere opposite to that which is experiencing winter. So if the distance from the sun being greater is the explanation for the winter in one hemisphere, then how does this same greater distance explain the summer in the other hemisphere? But if the reader will follow the argument in any textbook, he will see that, according to the theory, when the Earth is nearest the Sun, there must be summer in both northern and southern latitudes. Exactly what science textbook says that the seasons are due to the distance from the Sun and not the axial tilt? This, combined with its location along its orbital path, are the only reasons we have seasons. Anyways, Dubé, you and your Flat Earth affiliates are all fucking idiots. If the Earth were truly a globe, the Arctic and Antarctic polar regions and areas of comparable latitude north and south of the equator should share similar conditions and characteristics such as comparable temperatures, seasonal changes, length of daylight, plant and animal life. Wrong, you idiot! Since the Earth is truly a globular sphere, the only thing that one can count on is an equal amount of energy from the sun striking comparable latitudes at comparable times of the year. For instance, during the summer solstice in the north, the latitude 66.6 .6 degrees north 
will receive the same amount of solar energy that 66.6 .6 degrees south will receive on the summer solstice in the south. What the Earth does with that energy is completely dependent on the physical properties of the surface at that location. Thomas Winship says, If the Earth be the globe of popular belief, the same amount of heat and cold, summer and winter, should be experienced at the same latitudes north and south of the equator. The same number of plants and animals would be found, and the same general conditions exist. Thomas Winship, aka Rectangle, like Eric Dubé, is also a fucking idiot. And yes, I'm not kidding, his pseudonym was Rectangle. The Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere are completely different. There is much more landmass in the North than in the South, and the landmasses in the South, like Antarctica, tend to be at higher elevations than the average elevation of the land in the North, which is why Neil deGrasse Tyson said that the Earth is pear-shaped, and it's these factors that contribute to the temperature, flora, and fauna of a region. That the very opposite is the case disproves the globular assumption. The great contrasts between places at the same latitudes north and south of the equator is a strong argument against the received doctrine of the rotundity of the earth. Oh Stuart, the doctrine of the rotundity of the earth is ill-perceived at best. I see what you're trying to do here. You're trying to impress your third grade followers with bigger words. At least bigger words for you idiots. It makes me wonder how impressed you were when you read those same words when Samuel Robotham wrote them in the 19th century under the pseudonym Parallax. In fact, every argument Eric Dubé has ever presented was pulled directly from the very first Flat Earth Con Man's Guide to Taking Idiot's Money. It's called Earth Not a Globe. Unfortunately for Dubé, this book has been debunked since its publication, and most expertly by Jay Dyer in his book A Reply to Parallax. I'll post the link to the online publication of this book in the description. Antarctica is by far the coldest place on Earth, with an average annual temperature of approximately negative 57 degrees Fahrenheit and a record low of 135.8. The average annual temperature at the North Pole, however, is a comparatively warm 4 degrees. As it should be, because Antarctica's average elevation of 2.5 kilometers above sea level is much greater than that of the land around the North Pole, which has an elevation of about 150 meters. And as you go up in elevation, not only does pressure decrease, but so does temperature. So it stands to reason that Antarctica should be much colder than the northern Arctic regions. Throughout the year, temperatures in the Antarctic vary less than half the amount at comparable Arctic latitudes. The northern Arctic region enjoys moderately warm summers and manageable winters, whereas the southern Antarctic region never even warms enough to melt the perpetual snow and ice. The second key to this argument is that the Arctic Circle has a lot more water in it, whereas Antarctica only has water around its edges. Remember earlier when I spoke about the specific heat of water? Well, there's a second caveat to that property. While it takes more energy to heat water up, it also retains that heat for longer times, so that during the winter around the North Pole, the relatively warmer waters of the oceans and seas keep the atmosphere warmer than that of the dry, icy, and extremely elevated Antarctic region during its winter. In the Arctic, there are four clearly distinguished seasons, warm summers, and an abundance of plant and animal life, none of which can be said of the Antarctic. Well, I'd love to go over the explanation that I've already gone over several times, but I can pretty much just sum it up with a few words. Elevation, you idiot! In the Flat Earth model of the cosmos, these Arctic and Antarctic phenomena are easily accounted for and exactly what would be expected. If the sun circles over and around the Earth every 24 hours, steadily traveling from tropic to tropic every six months, which it doesn't, but please don't let me keep you from making yourself look like an idiot. It follows that the northern, central region would annually receive far more heat and sunlight than the southern, circumferential region. Since the sun must sweep over the larger southern region in the same 24 hours it has to pass over the smaller northern region, its passage must necessarily be proportionally faster as well. Again, you would have to start explaining how the sun is able to make these magical circles in the sky, and why we can't see it at night. 
And I don't want to hear that nonsensical shit about perspective, because as I've already stated, a person at the South Pole using the same observations you are using could easily come to the conclusion that the sun is circling the South Pole from his perspective. Eric Dubé, you're a fucking idiot. Dr. Samuel Robotham said, if the sun is fixed and the earth revolves underneath it, the same phenomena would exist at the same distance on each side of the equator. But such is not the case. What can operate to cause the twilight in New Zealand to be so much more sudden, or the nights so much colder than in England? Dubé, do you ever think to yourself, maybe I should do some research before I say something really stupid that makes me look like an idiot? No? Well, maybe you should. The closest point in England to the equator is Lizard Point, which is 49 degrees, 57 minutes north latitude, while the closest point of New Zealand to the equator is Cape North, and only 34 degrees and 25 minutes south latitude, or more than 1,000 miles closer to the equator than England. So given similar atmospheric conditions, it makes sense that the twilight in England is longer than the twilight in New Zealand. These differences in the north and south could not exist if the earth were a globe, turning upon axes underneath a non-moving sun. Except that they do, and they are completely explained with basic science. Oh, I forgot. You don't accept basic science because you're a flat earth idiot. The two hemispheres would at the same latitudes have the same degree of light and heat, and the same general phenomena, both in kind and degree. Oh fuck, you almost got it right. Yes. They would receive the same light and energy, but the physical properties of the surface and atmosphere will dictate how that heat affects the environment. In other words, just because we have the same amount of energy coming in from the sun at a certain latitude in the south that's 100% water, doesn't mean we should expect the same results from the same amount of energy striking 100% land at the same latitude in the north. The peculiarities which are found in the south as compared with the north are only such as could exist upon a stationary plane, having a northern center, concentric with which is the path of the moving sun. Your argument from incredulity does not impress me, nor does it impress the billions of people on this earth who can apply critical thinking to daily observations to conclusively exclude the earth from being a flat pizza disc. Everyone else is just a fucking idiot. And William Carpenter wrote, Every year the sun is as long south of the equator as he is north, and if the earth were not stretched out as it is, in fact, but turned under, as the Newtonian theory suggests, It wasn't Newton's theory, you idiot! It would certainly get as intensive a share of the sun's rays south as north, but the southern region being, in consequence of the fact stated, far more extensive than the region north, the sun, having to complete his journey round every 24 hours, travels quicker as he goes further south, from September to December, and his influence has less time in which to accumulate at any given point. Since then the facts could not be as they are if the earth were a globe, it is a proof that the earth is not a globe. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I'll start taking the flat earth seriously the moment that any one of those jackasses can explain how the sun changes speed and direction on its own without changing angular size as it approaches and leaves, rises in the same exact point on the horizon for every person on earth every day, why our atmosphere doesn't increase in temperature as we get closer to the sun, and I guess I'll make this my last one. Why isn't our atmosphere approaching thermal equilibrium with the sun if it's in our atmosphere? Those are questions that flat earthers need to quit willfully ignoring and start trying to scientifically answer. And until then, I will continue to call each and every flat earther out there a fucking idiot. Now I'd like to take the time out to thank Eric Dubé. Every time I think the flat earth is dead, he pokes his head out and reminds me that they unfortunately still exist. But Eric Dubé, you, along with all Flat Earthers, are a fucking idiot. Alright guys, thanks for sticking with me until the end. If you're still here, you either enjoyed the video or you have serious mental stability issues. Either way, be sure to click that like and hit the subscribe button to stay notified of new content. 
Unfortunately, YouTube has started making its move towards corporate domination, and in the process have put about 15 filters between you, the viewer, and the content you've subscribed to. So, not just for me, but for all the content creators you love to watch out there more than Jimmy Kimmel and company, be sure to head to their channels and click the bell button and all notifications so you can ensure that you get notified as soon as new content is published. Thank you to my channel members and patrons for your support. I'm Team Skeptic, and I'm out.